Hey Ronnie, we've got a number of customers nowadays that are talking or actually transitioning to a cloud service, yeah. like Office 365. What can they expect once they're there? Well, it's interesting, right? Because it's actually less about what they expect when they're there, it's more about what they don't think about when they're going to Office 365. So what we, what we often get asked from our clients is, you know, I'm gonna move all of my data into 365, Exchange Online, SharePoint, etc. cetera. Um, and there's, a, there's almost like this assumption that they're gonna pick it up and move it and when they get it there, there's nothing else they need to do. But the reality is, the you know what the service is providing is the infrastructure and the application. So you know to make sure it's patched, it's secure, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in its own enclave. But all of the admin tasks, all of the things you'd otherwise have to do if that environment was indeed still on premises, actually is still relevant. So a lot of clients then struggle with, okay, I've got this highly paid Exchange administrator that I've had. Now, how am I going to leverage them to do the typical things I need to, like admin tasks, you know, user account creation, user account deletion, distribution groups, group creation, e-discovery events, all of the sort of things that go into a day-to-day -day exchange admin that they still need to do, even though they're not worrying about the actual, you know, server itself and the application and all that sort of stuff. Similarly, again, when it gets to you know moving data and files onto SharePoint, there's a lot of there's still a lot of tasks and a lot of reporting that needs to be done. You still need to consider how are you going to back up that data, etc. So they're still very, very relevant things that quite often our clients don't necessarily think about at the time that they're looking to transition. But all that BAU stuff that we've always done in the past, patch management, the monitoring side of things, mm -hmm. do we still need to do that? No, patch management, monitoring, no. But absolutely, admin still has to happen. So user creation, user deletion, um, distribution list, groups, all of those sorts of things still need to happen. That stuff doesn't go away someone's still got to do that. And then when it comes to reporting, you still need to report. In fact, once you're into 365, it's even more important that you start reporting on what's going on in there because you actually have less eyes if you're not careful, right? So being able to report on things like, what are my users actually using? So when they go to 365, depending on the license that they buy, E1, E3, E5, et cetera, they get access to so much more than what they previously had when they were on premises. So all of a sudden it starts to become a different thing, like, okay, well, I'm an E3 user, so my users have access to SharePoint Online, to OneDrive, to Skype for Business. How much are they actually using that? Are we getting the most value for money out of what we've put in place? So being able to report on things like that, on license utilization, on you know, people, how much mailbox quota have they got? Are they leveraging online archives? If it's SharePoint Online, What's the growth of the SharePoint? It, you know, how has it grown dramatically in the past two weeks? Those sorts of things are still really important. Not the least of which is the whole security posture around it. So how are people configured? Who's got access to it? It's now up in the cloud. So you want to make sure you've always got a good eye on what's running up there in the cloud. Who's got access? What are they doing? What do they do day to day? And also because it's cloud based, it's actually accessible from anywhere. So now you've also got to think about, well, who's accessing this data? And what we're able to do is actually start to set up some, some triggers, right? So we can look for anomalous situations like that and have them provide an alert to say, hey, Gary's logged in here this morning and three hours later, he's logged in 5,000 kilometers, 5,000 miles away. Well, that's just not going to have made sense. Those kinds of things are things that we can look at and trigger those automatic sort of flags, if you like. So now you've also got to think about, well, who's accessing this data? And so things like, did Gary log in today in Sydney at nine o'clock in the morning and at one o'clock in the afternoon, we see a login come from Gary, you know, out of somewhere in South Africa, for example, right? Well, hey, that's anomalous. What's going on there? Being able to track that and to be able to report on that, to be able to alert on that and see what's going on starts to become a lot more important than when Exchange was in your own environment, you had a little perimeter around it and did all your own security things. Now it's out there in the cloud, it's exposed. So there's a lot of things that still need to happen to be able to say that, you know, I have a strong, reliable environment that I know is safe, secure, and I can report on it. So as the service stands today, hmm. how do we present those reports to the partner or to the customers? Well, you know, before we get into reporting, I think what's also important to talk about is once the data's in 365, people don't realize as well that it still requires a backup strategy. So yeah, the data's out there and Microsoft replicates it and they do all that wonderful stuff. Um, and you could be on legal hold, for example, uh, but you still need to have a backup strategy for that data. So we always start talking to our, you know, to our partners and our partners' clients about how do you actually create a backup strategy for 365 so that when you do need to do a restore, you can do so very quickly. 
Uh, mics you can certainly do restores through 365. They just tend to be quite tedious and they can take quite a long time with the process you need to go through. So backup as a service gives an insurance policy and also makes it really quick to be able to recover. So things like get a crypto lock of virus, how do we roll back really quickly, that kind of stuff. So when you say to recover or to restore quickly, mm. give me a few examples about that. Because what we normally see is when you restore data, it should come back in kind of the format that we backed it up. Yep. How does this service differ? So with the backup of the service that we're selling through our partners to their clients, that very much enables us to take, for example, a mail that needs to be recovered and pop it straight back where it was. Same with a SharePoint file or a OneDrive file. Pop it straight back there as soon as we need it. Whereas the approach you'd otherwise have to take is to go and discover it and then put it back into one place and then copy it to Azure and then move it in. It's like a whole process. So that's one of the key differentiators when we do the backup. What are some of the concerns out there when it comes to security of 365 and how can we manage it so we can be a lot more proactive? What are customers doing? Yeah, I think a large part of one start is moving to the cloud, right? You kind of just lose, you lose sight, you lose eyes. You just don't get that visibility to what's going on. You don't necessarily have all the same alerting mechanisms that you would have if it's in, you know, an internally controlled type environment. So, um, you know, I think it was one of your clients actually when we were we were talking to them about, you know, they had a that they're in three six five today, and they were concerned that one of their users was going rogue. Mm -hmm. Right, and that you know this user, it's like, oh, we're we're starting to see some stuff leak into the market, and we think it's this person. So that's when you've got to really start having the right tool sets to be able to do that discovery to say, okay, well, what has that person been doing? If you remember what we found in that one, right? I mean, you probably remember better than I do. What do we find? We found that the that particular user was a senior person in the organization, member of the executive. They had three different people with delegated access. Correct. And they weren't all EAs, is that right? Correct. So that sort of raised a, a red flag. I think we also found that that person hadn't changed their password in, you know, their password wasn't their even set to expire. Their password was set to not to expire. Ever. Exactly. Right, for a senior person in the business. Like, oh, well, we don't want to make the senior people change their passwords, but the risk of that you know, okay, don't make them change their passwords, but at least have two-factor authentication. But how do you know whether that's turned on? Things like, okay, I've got a senior person in the business, do I have legal hold turned on? You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, I've got legal hold, it's great, but, you know, often when we're running our tools across and we're doing some reporting, we see that they actually don't have legal hold turned on mm -hmm. everywhere. Yep. But an IT admin will go, yeah, yeah, we've got legal hold turned on. How do you know, right? So it's those sorts of things that it's really important to be able to get visibility to. Another example of that was this executive had a number of people that had access to their mailbox. Mm -hmm. And three out of the five people actually were no longer with the company, but were still active. Oh, really? I didn't know that. So it's even worse. That could be a challenge to have visibility around that mm -hmm. as well. And that's the thing, right? You, you kind of just put it up and go, great, someone else's problem. But it's not. It's still your problem. So, yeah, when you look at the, the whole... Um, you know, DLP, for example, knowing, you know, what has a user actually done end to end? So it's not just about, yet yeah, their mailbox is secured. It's more about, well, what are they doing? What SharePoint files are they working on? What OneDrive files? Who are they sharing them with? Yep. How did they share those files out? If you don't have the right ability to investigate that and do it quickly, right? And that's the key, you know? So yeah, you could, you could sit there and dig through logs. And if you've ever tried to look at an audit log, I haven't. I just keep getting told that they're a nightmare to look mm -hmm. at. So unless you've got a way to visualize that really quickly, you're actually not even going to keep up with the business requirements of, hey, what's that person doing compliance-wise, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why it's really important to have those you know, kind of discovery audit capability in there too. How do we make sure that personal data is secure and managed within organizations? Yeah, look, that's such a topic, a hot topic at the moment, right? Obviously with GDPR happening in the UK, with the privacy laws changing in Australia, and of course, you know, the already super litigious environment in the US, we're finding that in each of our sort of different locations where we're present, which is those three locations primarily, that the ability to track what, firstly, be able to know what the private information and then secondly, to be able to say, okay, well, what's happened with that private information? Has it leaked out? If it has, so if there is a data leak somewhere, being able to have the information at the ready to say, right, who actually did something with that file? Where has that file gone? And actually follow it through its life cycle. So for example, if you had some top secret information that's sitting on SharePoint and you wanted to make sure it wasn't being leaked out and you wanted to make sure the access rights were only the people who should have access to it, 
being able to get, again, eyes into that so that you can see, hey, you know what? Gary, Gary's got access to that file. What the hell's happened there? How did, you know? And then, not only that, not only working out that Gary has got access, but being able to go forensically back and say, how did Gary get access? Which admin gave Gary access? Why did that happen? Where was the change process, et cetera? So as the privacy and the, and the, and the requirement now for organizations, not just to maintain the right levels of security around it, but also to report when there has been a breach, it's really important for an organization to understand where the breach has come from and then know what they need to do to mitigate that. So again, without the eyes, you're just not gonna know. So a lot of the stuff we can pick up is after the fact. Mm -hmm. What can we do to look at trends before that happens? From a security? From a security perspective. Yeah, well, again, with the tool sets, understanding what are the key flags that you want to track and then putting the right alerts in there. And that's what we do with our service, right? Is that we'll put in the right flags that people need to, to work out, hey, we wanna be very careful that this doesn't happen and that this doesn't happen. We wanna know when this happens, etc. Set it up accordingly so that we're alerted and we can jump on it immediately and make sure that it's not gonna be a drama. Ready to go. Trying. Take one of 68. Not if you get your shit together. I didn't say it, it has to go past two. Boom. And action. We have a number of customers talking about the transitioning to Can a Can you just talk service. to me like you're a human rather than like a robot? Oh, no, just be you, Gary. <laughs> just talk to me. We have a number of customers. I'm presenting the fucking weather. Just talk to me. <laughs> Hey Ronnie, it's harder with. Yeah, I know that. I won't ever, no, every time I talk to you, it's going to be, hey Ronnie. <laughs> hey Ronnie, there's a number of clients out there. Okay, we're going to use this. Sorry, your face is funny. <laughs> there's a number of. <laughs> This is not going to work. That That's right, just stop laughing at me. <laughs> you can't stop smiling. <laughs> and the question that we get asked a lot is, once I move in there, what can I do? Well, you're not, oh, come on, I'm on fire here and you're laughing at me. Just, off. <laughs> you can cut me out. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Can you do that like permanently? Um, <laughs> um, I think there were some other things that we picked up in that particular account, wasn't there? Maybe. That user account you don't remember? No. No, well that's not used to us, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Should have read that report. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me look like a fool on the internet. It doesn't make you look like a fool. Yeah, Gary, Gary mate, you look like a fool regardless. <laughs>